The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. Uh, so first, thank you to Dr. Sandberg and to the department for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, we were looking forward to being in person, but it makes sense why we're not. And, uh, I'm still glad to be here. <coughs> Excuse me. And a special thanks to Lauren for being such a tremendous host. Um, you know, we were scheduled to go out and have uh, some Nashville barbecue last night, and we found out Tuesday at about lunchtime that that wasn't going to be possible. And somehow, through wizardry that it continues to astound me, uh, Lauren still managed to get, well, there we go, to get barbecue to our house in time for dinner last night. And so we enjoyed that very much, and thank you. Uh, that was really generous of you. Uh, as she mentioned, I am coming to you from uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania this morning. And uh, really the street lights are genuinely shaped like Hershey Kisses here. This is actually downtown Main Street. Um, and this is the medical center. So when I moved here, people said like, why would you wanna go to Hershey? Isn't that place like in the middle of a cornfield? And actually, yes, there is a cornfield just off this side. Uh, it really is, uh, for, except when it's soybeans, but they kind of rotate the crops. Uh, but the other things that you'll notice are right out here in front of the hospital, there's a really nice baseball diamond, and uh, there are a lot of fun softball tournaments that happen here. It's surrounded by about seven miles of a paved biking trail that's a lot of fun. Uh, on this mountain or hill back here behind the medical center, the Area Mountain Biking Association maintains about six miles of trails. Uh, they're a lot of fun to ride. Um, and then off to the right side of the screen here that you can't quite see, there's actually a, a barn um, where they do large animal research. And Penn State was one of the locations where they developed one of the first uh, total artificial hearts. And we still have a, a long history and a very active mechanical circulatory support program. Um, here are the boys now, for those of you who haven't seen them for a while. And I owe a lot to Vanderbilt, uh, not only my training, but also our three oldest children were born in Vanderbilt University Hospital. Um, our oldest there on the left, Cohen, um, you know, my third year of medical school, uh, when I decided I wanted to be an anesthesiologist, my wife kind of nodded and she said, you know, uh, when Cohen was born, I still can't tell you who the obstetrician was that delivered him, but I still remember my anesthesiologist, Dr. Richardson. And so thank you to Dr. Richardson. Cohen's doing great. Uh, and then Charles, the next one in there, uh, his anesthesiologist <laughs> or my wife's was Dr. Chestnut. Uh, and she continues to talk about how gracious and how kind he was. Uh, Edison there, he was born in Hershey, so that's Milton, that's Hershey there. And then Silas, those of you who know me re may remember that Silas was actually born at the corner of Wedgwood and Carvel. And so that, uh, in the front seat of our Camry, parked about where that gray car is up there in the corner. So uh, yeah, Silas just had me for an anesthesiologist and I couldn't do a whole lot, but he turned out all right as well. Uh, Moving on to the meat of the topic for today, I don't have any disclosures except to say that uh, there will be a brief discussion of some off-label uses of devices for mechanical circulatory support. I don't expect we're going to spend a whole lot of time on that. If I can get that pop-up to go away. All right. <clears throat> and I won't belabor the learning objectives, but um, we're going to be talking about uh, right heart failure, right ventricular physiology, pharmacology, and talk about some evidence-based hemodynamic goals that I think are helpful uh, for the residents in particular. You know, I remember the way that this lecture started was I was sitting in what was then the brand new resident lounge up there on the second floor, and one of the current critical care fellows was talking to me about something. And he said, oh, Conrad, I can't wait for you to do your fellowship in critical care so we can talk about RV dysfunction, our right heart failure. And at the time, I remember thinking like, well, we could talk about it now, like I've got some time. Um, and so these are all the things that I wish I had known at that time uh, and that I hope will be of some benefit to the residents and uh, anybody who doesn't deal with this quite so frequently. So we'll start with a case, a, a not so hypothetical case of a 54 year old gentleman with a past medical history of high blood pressure, diabetes, 40 pack year smoking history, coronary disease, Status post multiple drug eluting stents, um, including to his RCA eight years ago, was coming in because he had a, a fixator on his left lower extremity and he was just going to get that revised. And so, uh, not so hypothetical, very junior anesthesiologist went to go see this uh, next patient 
And the patient says he's been having worsening shortness of breath, orthopnea to the point that he can't lay down. He sleeps laying flat, uh, laying up in his recliner. He wouldn't lay flat uh, to be examined. And so the anesthesiologist says to the surgeon, hey, we're going to need to do this under regional um, with the patient's head of his bed elevated, um, or we're going to need to wait for a TTE, to which the frustrated surgeon said he already had a TTE, his EF is 55%. We're going to leave it there for now, except to say that, um, you know, given the choice to have that conversation again, um, I might say the EF of what is 55% um, or to say, well, what about the EF of the other three chambers of the heart? But some historical context of our understanding of the circulatory system and the ventricles in particular. So, you know, I kind of figured that before I started reading about it, they had it pretty well figured out. Um, and certainly by Hippocrates, because he's a pretty smart guy. But um, with Hippocrates, the way that he saw the circulatory system, he said there's this vessel coming from the right ventricle that goes into the lungs. So, okay, the pulmonary artery. And that distributes nutritive spirits necessary for its nutrition. So that's the blood. Uh, and the left ventricle only contains air from the atria. Now, I think in terms of like pathophysiology of what happens towards the end of life, this is a really fascinating observation. They were doing human cadaver studies at this point. How could it be that they would think that the RV contains the blood and the LV only contains air? Um, and that might be an interesting discussion for people in the OR later today. Um, but that continued to be true. Galen, so up through 200 AD, um, he was the emperor's personal physician. And he thought basically the same thing. He said nutritive spirits were made by the liver, distributed by veins to the RV. They passed through, so his difference was they started finding some traces of blood on these in the arteries and in the LV after um, in their cadaveric studies. And so they said there's some blood getting across. So he decided that there were these pores in the interventricular septum to the LV that allowed some of that to pass from the RV to the LV. And it would combine with the air from the lungs to form these vital spirits that then went out to the rest of the arteries. And so their thought process was that the arteries pumped air from the lungs. And it wasn't until you get popes, and so that remains the status quo for the next thousand years, until in 1480, Pope Sixtus, who's better known for constructing the Sistine Chapel, he also sanctions human dissection, um, which had been forbidden um, by the Catholic Church up until that point. And so after that, it doesn't take long before Vesalius says, you know, I've never seen any of the most obscure passages by which the septum of the ventricle is pervious, although they're mentioned by professors of anatomy, since they're convinced that blood is carried from the right ventricle into the left. And so then, as you know, after over a thousand years of the status quo, as soon as they start doing some more serious studies of it, within a generation, they realize that this is probably not the case. And then William Harvey in 1628 uh, finally writes, you know, I saw that the blood forced by the action of the left ventricle into the arteries was distributed to the body in the same manner as it is sent through the lungs and held by the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, which motion we may be allowed to call circular. And so this is really the first modern description of a circulatory system. Uh, up until that point, it was kind of assumed that, you know, once it got to the capillary level, it was too small to see. And so they assumed it just kind of like soaked in and went away somewhere. And so I think at that point, we had a pretty good understanding of uh, the role of both ventricles in circulation. And so really the person that I blame for forgetting about the right ventricle uh, or for us forgetting about it uh, would be Francis Fontan. So in 1971, he described the procedure that bears his name uh, for patients with congenital tricuspid atresia. Um, but even Fontan in the original uh, description of the procedure, which is that middle picture there, he emphasized the importance of uh, maintaining that connection to the right atrium. Um, that right atrium um, in single ventricle physiology would become uh, hypertrophied and adapted. And so it was, he considered it important for maintaining the pulsatile flow, helping to get the blood back from the lower extremities and the lower body uh, up and into the pulmonary arteries and pushed through. Um, but it wasn't long until some of his colleagues said, you know what, we can make this procedure a lot simpler if we just bypass the heart altogether. Don't worry about it. Just put a conduit there. Let it flow by passive uh, motion. And the patients seem to do OK. Um, and at that point, I think, you know, we started forgetting some about the, the RV because, hey, they do all right without it. So if we go back to that original case, 
<clears throat> the question is, aside from knowing his EF is 55%, what else do you need to know? And it wasn't until 2013 uh, that the uh, right heart uh, society uh, put out this classification of right heart failure and they try to divide it up in between the different components. So they divide it between the systemic circuit, uh, which for them included the systemic veins down here, all the way up through the right atrium, the coronary sinus is also included as a systemic vein, the tricuspid valve, the free wall, the RVOT, everything up to the pulmonic valve is the systemic circuit. And you can have a right heart failure symptoms from any of those components. Um, up through the pulmonary circuit, which includes the PA through the pulmonary capillaries. And so they distinguish right heart failure, which can be any of those things, um, from right ventricular failure, which is a more uh, specific description of just the, the RV itself may be failing. And so they say that the alterations of right heart system lead to suboptimal delivery of blood flow and elevated venous pressures. And I think it's important for us to remember, and we calculate perfusion pressures of various organs all the time, that your perfusion pressure is always the amount of blood pressure pushing blood into that organ minus whatever is pushing back. And so if the CVP goes up and if that's the highest pressure pushing back, then that decreases your perfusion pressure to that organ. Um, and that's true for many organs, including the liver and the kidneys. And that's why they, those are often the first innocent bystanders that have problems with right heart failure. And so in 2018, the American Heart Association then puts out this uh, document, Evaluation and Management of Right-Sided Heart Failure. And uh, it's a fantastic document. I highly recommend it. It's about 40 pages. It's a little dense, but it does a beautiful job of really organizing uh, what we presently understand about RV dysfunction. And also, I think, really disabusing us of some of the uh, traditions that were taught by our fathers. So for example, when I was in medical school, sitting in Light Hall, I was hoping to actually be in Light Hall today to be able to point to the chair where I used to sit at and say, when I had the lecture on RV failure, um, the thing that the person giving the lecture said was, the most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure. And that was kind of the end of the discussion. And that's true as far as it goes. And if you're a cardiologist in an outpatient setting, then that's maybe what you need to know most of the time. Um, but for an anesthesiologist, it's an inadequate explanation. And so in this document from the American Heart Association, they list causes of right heart failure. And certainly at the top of the list for chronic right heart failure, you've got left heart disease. And that's true as far as it goes. But if you look at the causes of acute right heart failure, you have things like positive pressure ventilation, hypoxia, acidosis, excessive transfusion, sepsis, perioper uh, perioperative injury and ischemia, which sounds like an average Tuesday for us, right? Like this is what we deal with all the time. And particularly in the age of COVID in the ICU, we're certainly dealing with that acidosis, hypoxia, positive pressure ventilation, increased intrathoracic pressures, um, and all of those issues that come along with it. And so we have to keep those in mind as we're thinking about not only those chronic right heart failure patients, which we do have some of, but also the acute sources of right heart failure in the operating room. Oh, and then ARDS, as we mentioned with COVID. Um, and then there's that note there about myocarditis. And, you know, when I first started preparing this lecture, uh, they were in the process of deciding whether or not to cancel the college football season because this link between myocarditis and COVID-19. The pause in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, with blood clots, there was a lot of discussion just recently about a couple of incidents of children with myocarditis after getting the vaccination and whether or not that was a reason to stop giving it to children. So uh, that's an issue that hasn't gone away. RV dysfunction, um, you know, it's because we often uh, don't talk about it, I think there's a perception that this is a really rare problem. Um, it, I'm sure this never happens at Vanderbilt, but occasionally where I am now, I'll on the call the night before with a resident, I'll say, okay, and how's the patient's heart? And they'll say, the EF is 55%. Uh, to which I say, okay, well, how's the rest of their heart? Uh, and so that knowing the LVEF is a start, but it's certainly not everything. So if you look at heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, depending on the patient population, if you're just looking at 
generalized outpatients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, it's still 16% of the population. Uh, but if you look at patients who have a history of dilated cardiomyopathy, it's up to 60, 65% who have reduced, uh, who have RV dysfunction as well. And a, about 50-50 chance, if you've got somebody who's got an acute heart failure exacerbation who's in the hospital, that they also have right heart failure. And so we might say, okay, for this guy, his EF is 55%, so it's not as big a deal uh, because the most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure. But the meta-analyses show that somewhere around a quarter of patients with a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction also have uh, RV dysfunction. And that is even higher in those who are hospitalized with heart failure, up to 50%. Um, so it's not an uncommon problem. It's maybe an under-recognized one. And the clinical significance of this is that, you know, you get RV dysfunction. And if you also have pulmonary hypertension, it's a strong predictor of adverse outcome. And more so than just the PA pressures alone. And so other things that you can see that lead to increased mortality are if you see increased uh, RA and RV dilation, increased right atrial pressures, decreased PA capacitance, decreased cardiac output, all of those are poor prognostic indicators. And so I thought at this point, I would include a slide that it reviews all of the papers looking at the perioperative outcomes for patients with RV dysfunction having non-cardiac surgery. So I've done that here. There are none. I, could, I couldn't find one. If anybody manages to find one, please let me know. Um, but if you're looking at people who are uh, trying to look for how much does it increase your risk if you've got RV dysfunction having non-cardiac surgery, there's just nothing literally out there. So that's on my to-do list is to try to uh, collect some data and work on that. If anybody would be interested in collaborating on that, please let me know. Uh, but there, we do have some data from patients who have uh, RV dysfunction who are not having surgery. So just the chronic RV dysfunction patient. And if you look at this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve on the left, this is looking at, okay, if you've got a normal RVEF and a PA pressure, uh, your two-year mortality is something like less than 10%. Uh, if you've got just RV, isolated RV dysfunction, it's still not bad. And it's like 12%. Similarly, if you've got elevated pulmonary pressures, it's about 12, 15%. But if you combine RV dysfunction with pulmonary hypertension, your two-year mortality is somewhere around 55%. Um, now, if somebody had a cancer with a two-year mortality of 55% and a surgeon came to you and said, hey, I think that I ought to replace this guy's shoulder because it's giving him pain, we might say, you know, are you sure that this is a good idea? And yet somehow if they've got RV failure, we say, yeah, we'll manage to get them through. Um, so, and this is not an isolated finding. So that was from the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Um, similar finding from an entirely different group of patients in the European Heart Journal, where they again found a two-year mortality in patients with uh, RV dysfunction. And these are patients with preserved ejection fraction. So their LV is normal. Uh, a two-year mortality of greater than 40, 45%. This is the point in the lecture where I'm supposed to remind you to sign in to your CME, text 40117, uh, so you can get credit for being here. All right, so if we look at how do we, so we've said that recognizing RV dysfunction is a problem, how might you find it? So the most common way that we see it documented on our ECHO reports here is in the most places probably is with the TAPSI. And so a TAPSI normally is 2.4 centimeters or 24 millimeters. And if it starts getting down below about 17, 18, you start to worry. And so the TAPSI, for those of you who don't do a lot of echo anymore, is just you're doing a four, apical four-chamber view. You put M mode through this uh, lateral wall of the RV, and you're looking at the tricuspid annulus, and you're seeing between systole and diastole how far does that uh, annulus move. And... The problem with that is it can be misleading because you're looking at a single point in the RV and the RV is a complex structure with a, lot, a crescent shape wrapped around a cone. And um, it may or may not be a great indicator of your overall function of the RV. And it can be changed based on people who've had prior cardiac surgery. It's no longer very reflective of your RV function. It has a lot of limitations. Uh, it also doesn't tell you kind of how briskly it gets there. 
And so not all tapsies of 2.0 centimeters are the same. So if it gets there very briskly, you might have a lot of RV reserve. Whereas if it just barely gets there before the end of systole, um, you may be on the edge of a cliff. Uh, so some people have started looking at, for example, the tricuspid uh, S prime velocity, where you're looking at the same place, but instead of measuring the tapsy, the, the movement, you're, the distance, you're now measuring the velocity. And a normal velocity is about 14 centimeters a second. Uh, similarly, so the problem with that is that it still only provides you with data about a single point in the right ventricle. Um, and so that has led some people now to calculate right ventricular fractional area change. Uh, historically, this was more challenging because, you know, in the left ventricle, it's relatively cone shaped. And so they could calculate Simpson's discs where you basically cut it into slices and then you would add up the volumes of all those slices together. And it was relatively straightforward to calculate a volume of the LV. As you can see, the RV is more complex in its uh, structure, and that can make it more difficult. But with modern echocardiography software, it's relatively straightforward to calculate a fractional area change. And so a normal fractional area change is about 50%. And if it's less than 40, then you might start to worry and say, I wonder if we need to look into this some more. And finally, more recently, people have been looking at RV global longitudinal strain, or some people are advocating more so for uh, just looking at the free wall and doing the, or the lateral wall and doing lateral longitudinal strain. Um, and there are different normal numbers for those two different measures of strain. Um, and unfortunately, a full discussion of strain is going to be beyond the, uh, the scope of this particular discussion. I, just to say that basically what it will do is it allows you to use software to not only track one aspect of the ventricle um, or the change within the ventricle, but the relationship of the different parts of the ventricle to itself. And so it, the software will track speckles within the wall of the myocardium and see how they change in relationship to each other and calculate a strain for you. And the normal is minus 21.7. Um, on average, although it does depend not only on age and sex, but also the manufacturers have not yet standardized their measures of strain. And so there's a little bit of variability there, but the closer you get to zero, the worse it is. And for at least cardiac surgery, RV strain imaging has been found to be independently prognostic. Um, and poor strain is indication of a poor outcome. So, we don't routinely have this available where I am. I don't know if you guys are seeing this routinely on any of your echo reports, but I'm told by the echocardiographers that, that it is now relatively straightforward to obtain if you ask for it. And then finally, um, we never see this, but I think it's a nice illustration of the progression of uh, RV dysfunction um, is you can do a volumetric MRI. Uh, to calculate the ejection fraction of the RV and you can do 3D reconstructions and come down to within a couple of cc's what the cardiac output is, what the RV ejection fraction is, and what the total RV stroke volume is. And so you can see in early RV dysfunction, you get a little bit of right atrial uh, dilation. The RV you start to get some apical sharing with the LV down there at the base. And oh, if I put my arrow over there, you can see what I'm pointing to even better. Whereas with, uh, as it starts to progress, your RA starts to become more dilated, your LRV starts to become even bigger than your LV. It starts to shift the interventricular septum. You get the septal flattening. It starts to take up some of the space and the uh, LV starts to be compressed um, from the RV next door. Uh, so this is moderate RV dysfunction. And then when it gets to be severe, um, you now have a massive right atrium, a massive right ventricle. You're taking up all of this space. The, you can see now the pericardium is really stretched out. And you can imagine if you were to take a chest x-ray of this person, that their, peric their cardiac silhouette would take up maybe 80% of the cross section of the chest. And so there are lots of, so those are imaging modalities. And you know, the more accurate they are, the harder they are to obtain, and you may or may not have access to all of those. But for the residents out there, if you could at least go as far as saying, when somebody asks you, how's the heart, say the left ventricular ejection fraction is 55 and the TAPSI is 
that would be a significant improvement from what I typically get anyway. Um, now, hemodynamic assessment of RV failure, there are lots of different ways that you could try to assess it, and it's best described in, in LVAD um, because RV dysfunction is so terrible um, and such a dreaded complication of LVAD placement. You take a patient who is already tenuous, you told them you were about to give them a life-changing operation, and if they come to find out had worsening RV dysfunction than you appreciated, um, and now they have a brand new LVAD and you just are spending your entire weeks dealing with RV failure, it can be really frustrating and outcomes are not very good. And so there's been a lot of research into trying to predict who's going to have RV failure after LVADs. Um, and so I won't spend a lot of time talking about those, but I did think that it's useful to talk about the pulsatility index. So uh, in patients after an MI, if their pulsatility index is less than one, uh, they have poorer outcomes. And that pulsatility index is where you take the systolic pressure, the PA systolic, minus the PA diastolic. So what is the con contribution of the RV divided by the right atrial pressure? So how much is it able to do above kind of what the passive flow would be? And if that number is less than 1.85 um, after an LVAD, then your RV is really struggling. Uh, and so if you look at it a different way in terms of the pulsatility index, and there's the uh, equation up there at the top, you can imagine that as your PA pressures start to go up, it, your RV continues to adjust and to uh, try to compensate until eventually the RV, it's one of my friends here calls it the snowflake ventricle. He's like, it just, after a while, it just gives up and it quits. And once that happens, then you rapidly start actually going down on your PA pressures because the RV can no longer overcome that extra afterload. And so as that happens, then you start to see your right atrial pressures go up as it can no longer offload this volume loading that it's dealing with. And eventually as those two numbers meet, um, then your pulsatility index approaches one in your cardiac, which your cardiac output is slowly but surely dropping off. And at that point, you're basically back to this Fontan physiology where the RV is not doing anything. It's just a passive conduit allowing uh, blood into the pulmonary arteries. And so the statement from that American Heart Association paper is that given the limitations of echocardiographic and hemodynamic variables, no parameter in isolation can adequately identify clinically significant RV failure or right heart failure with high sensitivity or specificity. And so if you've got more information, you should take advantage of it and use it. We'll spend one minute talking about cardiac ventilator interactions. So um, with if you look at pulmonary vascular resistance, which is what we were just talking about, the RV has a hard time overcoming acute changes and in increases in PVR. Um, both overinflation and underinflation are problematic. So you wanna be in this happy place where you've got just enough distension to keep those uh, alveoli open, but not if you go too much and too high, uh, then you end up with increased airway pressures, increased vascular stretch and secondary vasoconstriction. So the alveoli can actually be pressing on those capillaries um, and those small vessels to the point that it's increasing the afterload on the RV. Now, similarly, if you have underinflation, then you've got regional hypoxemia and atelectasis, and that also leads to some reactive vasoconstriction, that normal hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which is also not good. And so you need to be in this happy Goldilocks zone. And for every patient, that can be different. Um, for me, as I was preparing for uh, taking the oral board exams, I think that uh, the most useful thing, and for the residents who are on the call, is to think about, you are going to sit across the table from someone if we ever get back to doing in-person oral board exams, or on the other end of a Zoom call from someone who's going to say, you have a patient with a heart problem. I don't know what the heart problem will be, but I can guarantee you will have a patient with a heart problem. And then they're going to ask you what you're going to do about it. And so for me, a helpful framework to use for that is to say for any given heart problem, um, I have a specific set of goals. And my goals, I frame them in terms of saying, this is my goal, rate, rhythm, preload, afterload, and contractility. And the reason that is nice is because the rate is relatively straightforward most of the time. So for stenotic lesions, you want it to be a little slower. For regurgitative lesions, you often want it to be a little faster. But for most people, you want it to be about normal. Um, if you've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or something, then or systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, you decide might decide you want it to be um, on the slower side. But overall, the rate is pretty easy for us to figure out what, whatever the problem is. The rhythm, the correct answer is 
pretty much always normal sinus rhythm. And we'll talk more about why that is. And then that gives you a couple of seconds to think about, okay, what are my goals for the preload, the afterload, and the contractility of this patient? And so if we take that same framework and apply it to patients with RV failure, you can say, okay, so what's your goal rate? And for me, in RV failure, you want them a little faster, and we can have a discussion about why that is, or if people agree or disagree, I'd be interested to hear other people's thoughts. But um, I usually shoot for a heart rate of about 100 to 110. And we'll give some evidence for why that might be the right goal in a little bit here. The goal rhythm is to be uh, in normal sinus, as we said, always. And atrial tachydysrhythmias are really common in the setting of elevated right atrial pressure. So when you get that atrial stretch, whether it's a chronic atrial stretch due to a patient with progressive heart failure or acute atrial stretch from somebody getting a TACO, for example, transfusion-associated cardiac overload, then it can cause tachydysrhythmias. And those are very poorly tolerated in RV dysfunction and can lead to rapid hemodynamic dis- deterioration. And so this is probably my favorite reference from this entire talk. I just love this paper. It's so elegant. And I wish that I had thought to do it. Um, but in this paper, they're looking at the contribution actually of the right atrium to cardiac output and to right heart failure. Um, And so they were looking at in patients with and without pulmonary hypertension and how did they respond? Um, And so they actually divide up the TAPSI uh, into two different components, the TAPSI that happens passively um, and the TAPSI that happens actively. And so you can see up here, this is a normal TAPSI in a patient where um, you can see normally that through passive filling, that tricuspid annulus starts to get pushed away from the apex as the RV starts to fill. Um, And then halfway through, about here. So this is diastole, filling, filling, filling. You can see the, as that starts to happen, the vent, the tricuspid annulus starts to move away from the apex. And then about halfway through things level off and it starts, uh, it stops filling. So the tricuspid annulus is no longer moving until you get to the P wave when you get atrial contraction. And then there's this second aspect of the TAPSI uh, where you then get uh, that atrial kick that we so frequently talk about. And you can actually separate those two components of the passive filling portion of TAPSI versus the right atrial contraction portion. And so this is what it looks like in a normal patient, Um, but you can see that in a patient with pulmonary hypertension, for example, um, you end up with a much shorter period of passive filling, a much longer period here where nothing is happening because the pressures are already too high and the CVP can no longer overcome that pressure within the right ventricle. And then an important aspect here where when you get at the P wave, atrial contraction, an additional element of TAPSI or tricuspid excursion. And so doing this, they were then able to calculate both the change in the right atrial um, uh, volumes as well as the cardiac output and determine what percentage of the cardiac output Uh, was secondary to right atrial contraction. Um, And so interestingly, they found that, you know, the TAPSI for uh, these, oh, I pulled up all of them. The TAPSI was actually not too different um, in terms of the total amount that the right atrium contributed. So it's 0.8 and 0.9 in normal patients versus pulmonary hypertension. Um, But the Total TAPSI in normal patients is two and a half, like we said, whereas with those with pulmonary hypertension, it was 1.7, right on the edge of problematic. Um, Also worth pointing out that the stroke volume, uh, the total stroke volume in normal patients was about 70, right about what we would expect. Whereas with pulmonary hypertension patients, it was down to about 50. And the percentage of that that was due to right atrial emptying for the percentage of the stroke volume only about 11% in normal patients, but 40% in your pulmonary hypertension patients. Now, these were all patients with normal left ventricular ejection fractions. In both groups, the LVEF was 64%. They all had other causes of pulmonary hypertension and right heart dysfunction that were not left ventricular failure. And so the reason that becomes important is if you've got a normal stroke volume of 70 and you lose 11% of that when you go into atrial fibrillation, for example, uh, it's not a big deal. And most people tolerate atrial fibrillation very well. 
But if you've got pulmonary hypertension where your starting stroke volume is only 50 and then you lose 20%, so that's where I end up with saying, okay, if I need to, for an average size patient, maintain the cardiac output of about five liters a minute. And if their starting stroke volume is 50 with pulmonary hypertension, then I'm going to say their heart rate needs to be about 100. And now you see why if you have that patient who then goes into atrial fibrillation where they lose another 20, now your stroke volume is down to 30. Uh, and it's very difficult to maintain uh, adequate perfusion with a stroke volume of 30 in an adult. Uh, and so your best bet is to avoid them going into, heart, uh, into atrial fibrillation if you can help it. And if you can't, then to get them back into sinus rhythm as soon as possible. And so again, one more statement from that uh, American Heart Association document is that the teaching that acute right heart failure is a preload dependent condition requiring volume overloading is overly simplistic. Volume loading is overly simplistic. And I saw Dr. Robertson is on this call. Uh, hi, Amy. Um, and I'll never forget the day that I was doing a liver transplant with Dr. Robertson. And it was probably my sixth or seventh transplant. I was starting to feel like I had things figured out and the surgeon got into some bleeding and um, you know, so they let me know very appropriately, hey, we're getting into some bleeding here. We had the Belmont all hooked up. I go up on the Belmont flows and the blood pressure goes down. And I went up on the Belmont flows some more and the blood pressure went lower. And at that point I called Dr. Robertson. I said, hey, we're getting into some bleeding. I'm giving volume, but it doesn't seem to be helping. And she walked into the room, looked over the drapes, stopped the Belmont, and within 30 seconds, everything got better. And I said, Dr. Robertson, like, what just happened there? And she said, she said, oh, you just have to do that sometimes. But what she knew that I didn't know at that time was this picture. And so for the residents to remember that in a normal heart, you've got this crescent-shaped RV and this uh, donut-shaped LV. But if you fill the RV too quickly, um, either particularly acutely, you can get increased pericardial constraint where there, this is pericardium is not going to stretch. And so the only place that the RV can fill into is by taking up the space of the LV. It gets compressed, you get sat, flattening of the septum that decreases your LV stroke volume. Um, and it can lead to this vicious cycle of things getting worse and worse. And the only solution for that is to empty out the RV, get them back to their normal configuration. Um, and that will help. So we talked about that and you can actually quantify this with uh, what's called an LV diastolic eccentricity index, where you're looking at a short axis view of a left ventricle, and you can measure one axis versus another axis 90 degrees. And if the eccentricity index was more than 1.7, uh, it was independently found to give you uh, almost four times risk of uh, poor outcomes, which was actually a better predictor than just the TAPC of less than 15. Although that's certainly also a strong predictor of bad outcome. So as we mentioned, the RV doesn't respond well to increased afterload. As the mean PA pressures go up, at least in the acute setting, over 20 or 30, um, the stroke volume of the RV rapidly diminishes. Now over time, if it happens slowly enough, you can get some compensation, but acutely it doesn't tolerate it well. So, the questions that you'll get asked on random oral board exams and other things are like, what can you do to avoid increasing RV afterload and the things that I think about in the operating room. Um, and a, particularly as we're working on getting a patient extubated, getting them to the recovery room or avoiding hypoxia, hypercarbia, those we talk about all the time, acidosis certainly, and then pressors. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, getting off of the positive pressure ventilation, minimizing the intrathoracic pressure can be helpful. Uh, in decreasing your RV afterload. And then also pain and shivering. Patients, if their own sympathetic system is activated, can increase their RV afterload. So you can treat it by those ways that we already talked about. And if they don't have RV failure, uh, I'm sorry, LV failure, then you can consider things like epiprostol, either inhaled or IV or inhaled nitric oxide. Um, there are a couple of case reports of if patients have pre-existing LV failure and then you give epiprostanol and kind of massively shift all this fluid from the right to the left, that you then can end up with worsening LV failure. And uh, so don't do that. Um, and so even though there's no evidence that nitric oxide has ever improved any outcomes in anyone that I've ever found, um, it does make the oxygen better and it certainly makes us feel better. And I think that it does decrease the afterload on the RV. And if you need a bridge, 
uh, as you're struggling, it's a reasonable place to start. I know while I was at Vanderbilt, we used a lot more of the epiprostanol, and that seems to have a similar function. Uh, it's a little more cumbersome to use. <clears throat> and so the effects of vasopressors, there are not a lot of clinical trials to guide our effects, but depending on what source you read, it will say that the lungs have either no vasopressin receptors or very, very few vasopressin receptors. And so if you're dealing with a situation where you've got hypotension, but elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, vasopressin can be a nice drug that's really helpful because it can raise your systemic blood pressure without increasing your PVR. And also because it's not a sympathomimetic, um, it does not cause AFib to the rate that a, uh, norepi and some of the other uh, sympathetic, sympathetic agonists will. And so for us, vasopressin is often one of these options where it allows us to have our cake and eat it too. So we talked about rate, rhythm, contractility now, um, and we're gonna talk about inotropes. So any of these um, are inotropes. You've got the inodilators like milrinone and dobutamine, um, as well as some of the beta agonists like isoproteranol, epinephrine, um, and all of these things increase your cardiac oxygen consumption. So depending on the cause of your RV failure, they may or may not be helpful. Um, but there's something to consider if you've already optimized the rate, the rhythm, the preload, the afterload, then kind of what you're left with is trying to do what you can to help the contractility. And so we won't spend a lot of time talking about um, inodilators today, except to say that milrinone is a pulmonary and systemic vasodilator. So if you've got blood pressure to work with, it can be helpful. And it does act uh, much more long acting than dobutamine. And so it can be a little more challenging to titrate but it does cause less tachycardia than dobutamine. And so if in these patients where you're worried about those tachydysrhythmias, it may be helpful. And then I'll spend the last couple of minutes. I'm not going to, you know, this would be another lecture for another day and I'd be thrilled to come back and talk about it. But um, there are mechanical circulatory support options for patients where you've done everything that you can for the rate, the rhythm, the preload, the afterload, the contractility, you've optimized everything. The patient is still struggling. At that point, what do you do? Um, you've got the Impella RP as an option. So you thread this Impella that's been flipped on its head um, that can get you up to about five liters of flow a minute uh, that comes up through the IVC, across the tricuspid valve, across the pulmonic valve, and then it pulls blood from the IVC, ejects it out into the pulmonary arteries and can help to offload the RV. Um, that usually needs to be placed under fluoro, and, um, but they seem to work okay. Uh, limitations are that you can't oxygenate through it like you can with some of the ECMO circuits because it's an impella. Um, and so if you've got RV failure because of hypoxemia and hypercarbia, it doesn't do you a lot of good. Uh, there's the tandem RVAD, which we don't use a lot of here. I don't remember using many of them in uh, residency. I saw a couple in fellowship. The Protec Duo is a double lumen cannula, a lot like the Avalon cannula. So it will pull blood out of the uh, IVC and SVC and then it goes out through the pulmonary artery and then it will eject the blood out there. So it's RV bypass. And this one, you can connect an oxygenator into that circuit to help with the hypoxemia, hypercarbia. And then the challenge is trying to figure out how to get off of it. Um, because it's a double lumen cannula, you're limited in how low you can go with the flows before it clots. And all else fails, you can use VA ECMO and bypass the heart entirely uh, with all the challenges that come with that. So with that being said, uh, this is the view out my office, uh, or at least it was my office. Uh, it's not Raj Gupta quality. It's taken on my phone through a window, but for something with no filters and no post-process editing, I'm pretty proud of it. And uh, if there's any of the current critical care fellows who would be interested in living in a small town with good public schools and no traffic, um, there's my email down there and we're always recruiting. I'd be happy to talk with you about it. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Conrad, it looks like you have a question in the chat. Um, someone was asking about benefits or detriments of magnesium and right heart failure. A fascinating question. I uh, do not know. What do you think, Dr. Blair? I've not come across any data uh, one way or the other on it, but I wasn't specifically looking for it. 
So Conrad, I'm curious um, back to your sort of original case presentation. Yeah. Um, what 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 do you do now practically? Um, you went over a tremendous amount of um, excellent review for understanding the right heart. But when you get back to that question, you have it's not developing in the OR, but it's you've got time to pause. Um, what what would you say um, that you think is the the best approach to that sort of patient, particularly given the symptomatology um, uh, that you discussed? Yeah, so I think the first question is, if you don't have a good echo, you ought to get one. Um, and that may involve having a cardiologist come do one, or depending on the individual's comfort level and skill level, um, if you're comfortable wheeling an echo to the bedside and getting a, an initial look, um, if you because this guy has lots of reasons that he might be short of breath, right? And so it may just be his COPD. It may be that he's got pneumonia. It may be something else. Um, but so for me, I start by getting an echo, either doing it myself, or if I am not able to do that, then, uh, pausing the case, delaying things until we can get an echo. And so that I know more than just the EF, I want to see the, what is the right atrial size? What is the tap C? What is the S prime velocity? Those are the ones that I typically can get on an echo report preoperatively, um, kind of at the bedside. Um, and then, you know, avoiding positive pressure if you can. So for a patient like that, oftentimes, um, the using a, a regional technique or an epidural or a spinal is helpful. And if it's a procedure where you can't avoid it and the case has to go ahead, then you try to limit your uh, intrathoracic pressures. You try to maintain that adequate, uh, keep the rate appropriate, keep the rhythm appropriate, uh, maintain their preload, but not overload them. Um, and then do avoid all those things that will worsen their uh, PVR. And so make sure that they don't get acidotic, they don't get hypoxic. For pressors, I primarily will use, if I've got blood pressure to work with and I think that their cardiac output is low, then I will use primarily milrinone. Um, oftentimes you don't have blood pressure to work with. Um, and then you have to choose between either milrinone plus vaso, or if their heart rate is lower than you want it to be, you might decide to do epi instead. Um, so that part, I think it's a little more into the, the art of it. I don't know of a good kind of, there is no uh, well-established evidence-based guideline for how to manage that intraoperatively. Yeah, I just think that concept of hearing that it's important enough to really pause. And, oh, yeah. Unless needed, um, you know, be, be safe by not engaging that until you have to is important. Because I think the concept of we can get them through um, is probably true, but not necessarily best for the patient.